Welcome to Greenlit, the Buffalo 8 podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Halderman, and each week we're going to dive into a different piece of content, film and television, and we're going to talk with some of the biggest names in front of and behind the camera as we dive deep into how they were financed, produced, developed, marketed, and the crazy stories behind how many of them got made. Welcome back to Greenlit. On today's episode, we're chatting with cinematographer Robert Yeoman. His path is so unbelievably fun, especially for people that like Wes Anderson, Roman Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola, Paul Feig, Judd Apatow, the list goes on and on. His career has now risen to shoot a number of studio movies, most notably Bridesmaids and Ghostbusters. But hearing the stories about how he and Wes worked together for 25 years as of the recording of this podcast in 2020, dating back to their first film, Bottle Rocket, in 1995 is just an amazing story of friendship and partnership in a crazy industry that has changed so many times over since they started working together. I'm really proud to be able to call him a friend. And without further ado, enjoy this conversation with Bob Yeoman. Welcome back to Greenlit. Today I'm talking to Robert Yeoman. So first off, Bob, Thank you for covering out the time and chatting today. Great. Glad to be on it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Well, I met Bob a number of years ago, and I want to come back to that story. But I actually want to start with Bob having worked on every live-action Wes Anderson movie, and also with directors like Nolan Baumbach, Paul Feig, uh, and Roman Coppola. And so there's so many projects to choose from. Uh, but I want to chat and at least start the conversation off with Rushmore and how Rushmore was greenlit and or Bob, how it came together and how it was made from the time you coming on board and obviously it's such a pivotal movie for so many people involved with that project. Well, I had originally met Wes before Bottle Rocket, which was his first film. And uh, Wes and Owen Wilson and Luke Wilson had done a little short uh, of their film Bottle Rocket, which they showed at Sundance, and it uh, got to Polly Platt, who was a producer for Jim Brooks at uh, uh, Jim Brooks's company. And Jim Brooks uh, met Wes and Owen, and was like them, and gave them the money to make Bottle Rocket. And uh, so I still have the the little letter that Wes sent me, handwritten in his own distinct handwriting. You know, dear Mr. Yeoman, um, I wrote this script called Bottle Rocket. I'd love it if you read it. And uh, I immediately fell in love with the film and, and uh, so the script anyway. And I met Wes. And at that time, I had done a series of very low budget indie type movies. I had yet to do a big studio movie, which none of these movies were. And a lot of these movies, quite honestly, were going nowhere. And I was, you know, hoping to move up the ladder, so to speak. And uh, But I met Wes, and he was a 25-year-old kid and never directed. And, you know, it had all the earmarks for, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen with it. But we yeah. hit it off right away. And um, uh, I just liked him, and I liked his ideas, and he seemed very bright. And we kind of... I remember our first meeting, we, we kind of talked about movies that we liked and actually movies that we didn't like. And uh, we kind of agreed on just about everything. And so we really hit it off. So he offered me the movie. We did Bottle Rocket. And uh, it, it, at first it wasn't particularly successful, but then it uh, caught on. Martin Scorsese kind of uh, uh, talked about it and said, you know, what a, a up and coming talent Wes was. So, of course, when he sent me the script for, Rush, for Rushmore, uh, I was on board. Uh, we had such a great time together on Bottle Rocket. And uh, we got involved very early uh, in the casting. And not to say too much, but I know there was one actor, young actor, who was going to play the lead. And we were all kind of uh, uh, sold on this one young kid. And... Uh, then Jason Schwartzman showed up for uh, uh, an interview and a screen test, and that's when things changed. 
and uh, uh, Jason had never been in a movie before, but, uh, you know, West immediately said, this is my guy, you know, and, and even though Jason really didn't look like what Wes had described, uh, originally Wes was hoping for a, you know, quote, young version of Mick Jagger, <laughs> and uh, Jason was not that, <laughs> but it was an energy about Jason and a sweetness about him that uh, Wes immediately saw. And um, so we cast Jason and then um, uh, Bill Murray and, you know, the rest is history, you know, how that all the casting came along. So, you know, at that time, Bill Murray, I won't say his career was struggling that obviously Bill Murray's career never struggles, but you know, it was, it was a, a move in a different direction for Bill and it kind of gave him a breath of fresh air, I think. And so, uh, and he and Wesley, you know, they obviously hit it off right really well and the rest is kind of history. He's been in every movie since I think so, you know, great. You know. And Bob, so now you, you guys are, you cast Schwartzman here. And I believe that film shot down at the boarding school or the, the prep school that Wes had gone to, St. John's Prep in, in Texas. Yes. Is that all correct? Yeah, it's all in Houston, Texas, yeah. So full on location shoot, or was the was there any studio, any 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 anything on built on a stage uh, for that movie? You know what? Everything was locations. And uh, we shot it at St. John's and, and Wes had a quite a relationship there, so all the extras were St. John's students. There's the uh, Serpico play uh, with, the, with the kids put on. It was kind of based on Serpico. And uh, those were all St. John's drama students. And uh, we used the classrooms that Wes had been in. And some of the teachers were in it as well. And uh, so uh, we made it very much uh, uh, mostly there at St. At St. John's, but then there was the public school, which was down the street. When, when Jason gets kicked out of, uh, Max gets kicked out of uh, Rushmore. Uh, you know, it was all pretty much locations. I can't remember any studios. And, and you know, it was kind of, uh, uh, back then, Wes was very much into doing everything in camera. Uh, we, you know, now we've gone a whole different direction with, as you know, we're shooting movies. There's a lot of post-production that's involved in, in combining elements and, and things that we didn't do back then. So it was all shot on, uh, uh, pretty much practically all in camera, you know, <laughs> and, uh, we, we had wanted to do, uh, anamorphic on bottle rocket and, uh, we, uh, shot a test the studio said well or james brooks's company uh, gracie films they were like okay let's see a test so wes and i shot this test and we purposely made the anamorphic shots very kind of artsy and then we had to shoot the same scene in the spherical and we kind of made them a little bit more awkward and i you know fudged the lighting a little bit so it didn't look quite so good and we sent it off and they said oh we can't tell the difference you gotta shoot 185 so you know we'd always planned on shooting anamorphic for that film. So because of the success of Bot Rocket, Wes was able to get anamorphic. And so uh, that was our first venture into shooting the widescreen. That's great. And so the reason I ask about how much was shot on location versus things that may have been shot on sets or on stages, that movie, The Rushmore, definitely felt like you and Wes were really clicking in terms of building that really uh, definitive or go-to style that I think all of us think about when we think about a Wes Anderson movie. Curious on the prep process, how different it was prepping for Rushmore versus prepping for uh, Bottle Rocket. And then I, I want to take that as well, Bob, into Royal Tenenbaums, which became so hyper-stylized uh, across the board. Well, Wes has a very long prep period for me and the uh, production designer and the assistant director, uh, more so than most movies, because everything is very well planned out. And I think he learned from Bottle Rocket, which was his first film, uh, the value of, of this long prep. And uh, so we go to every location with the production designer and the AD and we, we talk it out you know in, in detail and even as time goes on we even would take film cameras with us and 
because we shoot film, we shot film on our film. And we would actually shoot the location in many cases in available light just with uh, the AD and the production designer and the location guy, whoever else have to be there, they stand in for the actors. We move them around the space and we play, uh, we play around with it a little bit and then we t look at it later and just kind of uh, evaluate it and, and we'll make changes. He also started to do uh, much more elaborate storyboards. So mm -hmm. after we've seen the location and kind of talked about things, he does his own little sketches, which are uh, uh, very, uh, you know, distinct. And yeah. if you want, I can send you a, co a few copies of those that you could show people. I mean, please, Bob, would, that'd be awesome. I bet people would love to see it. I'm sure. Yeah, and they're very, uh, you know, they're kind of crude but they're very charming in their own way and they certainly kind of tell the story of, of of how what we want to do and then starting around moonrise kingdom uh we started doing animatics which are little uh cartoons that are kind of hand-drawn and uh wes will take the storyboards and he gives them to uh this guy who turns them into these animatics and they Put West reads the dialogue and does all the characters, which is kind of interesting. In fact, I haven't seen it, but I think on the new Royal, is it no? The new uh, Grand Budapest Hotel Criterion version, they do have his animatic on there, which is hmm. it's worth seeing. Is it's it's because we all knew it very well, but we we always. I think it also came from his his work doing animated films, you know, and uh, he. Uh, was used to working that way in animation, and so he's applied that to actual live action shooting now as well. And so we frequently, when we get on the set and things aren't quite working, he has the animatic on his iPad, and we just kind of look at it again and try to. Uh, and I would say now most of the movies are shot pretty closely to what the animatic is. You know, occasionally mm. you have to make adjustments. Um, many times, because each shot kind of fits a particular piece of dialogue, and many times the real life actor cannot move down the hallway quite as fast as a guy can do it in uh, in the animatic. Right. So you realize, oh, gee, there's no way physically we can do this. So little adjustments have to be made uh, along the way, but we kind of stick to it pretty closely. Yeah, that was. I actually had a question and sort of. Uh just my outline here, which was how much spontaneity takes place with the West movies, if any at all. And it sounds like it's not so much spontaneity, it's more just adjusting on the day where you have to adjust when you have to sort of deviate a bit from the animatic. But overall, there's not a ton of, uh, and I know Noah Baumbach, who you also have worked with, is very similar in the sense that people are sticking to what has been written. People are sticking to what has really been uh, built with the production designer and the director of photography. Is there any, or are there any stories of deviating and uh, improvising or spontaneity in the in the Wes Anderson films that you've you've made? Well, it's it is it, it you know it, it it's a lot of it has to do with more uh, what the actors are doing. I think you know because when he gets the cast there, obviously when you have the level of cast that he has. They kind of work things out with Wes, um, but visually we stick pretty much to the plan because he likes to work quickly. Uh, we often, generally, prelay the track beforehand. We worked it out beforehand, so when the actors arrive, uh, basically they uh, uh, th everything's kind of taken care of because that way Wes can spend all his time with the actors and, and right. he doesn't have to worry about what we're doing behind the scenes, you know? And so we pretty much stick to the plan. Also, uh, it's not unusual. Like uh, if, if someone was filming our interaction here, it would be very much what we have here. I would be in a whole different location than you and we're here talking to each other. Right. And like, like on Moonrise Kingdom, uh, the house, the big red house, he he loved looking towards the house there, but the opposite direction he didn't like so much at all. So we would shoot all the reverses at a whole different location, and mm. uh, 
So that is something that uh, is not unusual in a West movie. And, and it also allows us to be, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of directors will come to a location and they're not quite sure what they want to do. And so they, uh, you know, you basically have to be ready for anything. And that means not only me as a cinematographer, but the art department has to dress the entire place. Uh, whereas with Wes, it is so specific that he, he says, I'm only going to see, you know, this side of the room. And they don't have to look at the other side of the room. And they don't have to dress it. And we don't have to light the other side of the room. Right. So it, it makes it way more efficient and quite, um, you know, uh, and I think that's one of the many reasons that his movies, uh, you know, cost, you know, way less than they probably should because, you know, you're saving money in those ways, you know, um, right. that you so specific in what we're what we know we're going to see and uh you know i i try to talk to him as best i can and he accommodates me as best i can can we look this direction in the morning and this direction in the afternoon and you know particularly on day exteriors because uh west doesn't really like to do lighting outside um it it, it allows you to just you know shoot without using lights and and that means we go faster and also, uh, uh, you know, it'll look, from my point of view, it looks better. So, um, right. you know. It's great. Um, Going back, Bob, for a second to, to Rushmore. So Rushmore, you guys, now that the film gets released, commercially and critically, how is that film ex accepted? And how is that film, um, how is it receptive? How is it received from a an audience perspective but also how does it change things because i feel like tenenbaums is a is a big movie and i know tenenbaums is next and i'm just curious when you sort of think of it chronologically from bottle rocket to rushmore what happened in, in between that period between now rushmore and tenenbaums that may have been different than bottle rocket and rushmore well rushmore was critically uh well received commercially not as well received hmm. um and you know uh it's it's uh uh i remember when it came out in many ways for me selfishly if a movie i work on is well received in the film community that's almost better than uh if it's poorly received in the film community and makes a lot of money you know but people love the movie. I got a lot of uh, response from people. I know one person said, oh, I watched that movie. I loved it so much. I just sat in the theater and watched it again. <laughs> I didn't leave. And, uh, you know, it, it really struck a chord with a lot of people. I think at the time it was very fresh and different, not only in the tone and the writing, but in the way it looked. And I think Jeff, uh, uh, Wes made a giant leap uh, just uh, in terms of his filmmaking skills between Bottle Rocket and, and Rushmore. And it was a much more polished film. And I think you really felt, I mean, not that you didn't in, Rush, in Bottle Rocket, you certainly did, but you really felt there was, uh, uh, it was a vision of a particular filmmaker there. Right. And I think that attract, I think that attracted a lot of people in the film industry, which allowed him to get the cast, that we got on um, on Royal Tenenbaums, you know, certainly Gene Hackman, Gwyneth Paltrow, a lot of these actors probably wouldn't have signed on, but they, everyone in the film industry loved Rushmore, so they were more eager to work with him. He was kind of the new, the new up and coming hot director, I think. So, I think in casting it helped a lot, and it also uh, got him Scott Rudin. Uh, who is, a, we all know, is a very heavyweight producer. Yep. And uh, it, having a, a heavy hitter like Scott Rudin on your team uh, not, doesn't really affect me personally, but for uh, a filmmaker like Wes, it certainly opens a lot of doors and gets him into places that maybe he wouldn't have been able to open otherwise. So, you know, uh, that was a big addition to the, the team, I think. And, uh, you know, if he needed something done with the studios, he could call Scott and Scott could help him take care of it, you know, and, and right. give him, he gave him some muscle that I don't think he had before. Um, and yep. um, so I think it was the casting mainly that 
and and the addition of a little bit of muscle on the upper side that kind of was a big difference for us. It's great. Was was Scott um has Scott been involved in every West picture since Rushmore? I believe so. You know, yeah. we don't I personally don't really interact with him at all, and he's rarely uh, on the set. He, he came to the set uh, maybe once on Royal Tenenbaum, and, uh, yeah, because we were shooting in New York. Um, but I haven't seen him on the set ever since then. But I know Wes has phone calls with him, and he's more dealing with studio politics and right. you know uh, that kind of stuff that doesn't really affect me at all. Right. I want to shift gears just for a second. I want to come back to Wes and sort of the, what I would sort of call the, the next chapter of the films that you've, you've made with Wes over the years. But I want to touch on working with directors like Noah Baumbach and Roman Coppola and how much of that, Bob, you feel like spun out of, like you said, the film business and just the general audience really loving those first two movies in particular, but then Tenenbaums was such a life of its own as well transitioning them to working with someone like Roman or someone like Noah Baumbach, what that was like, what, how, how those films were different, what was similar in the approach, because they're obviously all of sort of this school of, uh, you know, I had, we had read a, a quote about you in preparation for this, uh, this interview about how if you read a piece of material and don't like the script, you'll, you'll pass on the movie, which is obviously a great, uh, a great credo to live by in this business. That that sort of collective of directors, pretty intellectual, pretty studied sort of students of history and students of, of art and, and of film history, again, Roman, Noah, and, and Wes. What was that like, that the, the transition to working with those guys in between making Wes Anderson movies and uh, in between sort of defining this, this, this style? Okay, well, I'm going to start with Noah. Um, the only reason I was asked to do Squid and the Whale is because Wes was producing, uh, was one of the producers on the film. And he contacted me and said, hey, this buddy of mine, Noah Baumbach, you know, once uh, is making this movie and we'd like you to shoot it. So I read the script and loved it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I, I hope I'm not train anybody but the movie was made for 1.5 million dollars <laughs> and we shot it in new york city <laughs> and uh, of course it was shot a while ago so that 1.5 is probably worth two million dollars now but i don't know but it's still crazy that's still crazy days. it is and we shot it in 24 days and i met noah and liked him and um uh, you know i just love the script and um you know we uh, shot 16 millimeter partially for uh, uh, savings and also because Noah was a big fan of the French New Wave and, and he liked the idea of a very loose camera style and allowing the actors to kind of move around and, and it was less structured visually than a West movie is, you know, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of it was handheld that I was hand holding the camera. And if the actors moved one way, I'd move over there with them, you know. And uh, so it was a much looser style of shooting. And, um, you know, it was a period movie. And I just remember one day, the one day Wes showed up on the set, <laughs> we were shooting a shot and Wes looked at it and he said, well, there's a lot of non-period cars over there. You know, and, and by that point, Noah and I had totally... You know, we realized that there's no way of shooting in Brooklyn and, you know, you know, we can't control the traffic in Brooklyn. So we were like, yeah, yeah, we know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, and then he just left us alone after that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, I, I'm sure Wes and Noah, because they, they, they're kind of writing partners. They spent a lot of time uh, in post together and, and uh, the movie is one of those movies I've worked on that turned out even better than I thought it would. And, you know, it's very, uh, uh, it's, it's a classic and, and I love it. And, uh, so it was a very different working relationship and, and Noah, because we had such a, uh, quick schedule, I think it was 24 days. Uh, we don't have a lot of time and he likes to spend time with his actors. So I tried to light the film as generally, as I could so that when the actors showed up, we weren't, you know, limited. Oh, we can't look there because the lighting is, you know, and, and so it was a different style for me 
and and uh, and whereas Wes is so precise about everything, and you know he wants everything to look just right. You know, I think no, and not that he doesn't care. He does care, but he he was just he had to get his movie made, and and he had to do it within a certain amount of time. And and I remember uh, uh, the AD David Wexler and I, uh, you know, were scheduling it, and, and we I went to Noah and said, Hey, listen, is it okay if we shoot this scene in the morning outside the house because the street looks so much better in the morning, and then we move inside later and. I remember him telling me, listen, I have to, uh, I just have to shoot my scenes and get this done. Yes. If that's going to make it easier. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I can accommodate that, which was very nice of him. And, and, um, I think there was only one scene of all everything he written, he wrote that we, we didn't get, we hmm. got everything. So I, I think he was pretty happy with that. Uh, Roman, I'd known Roman Coppola. I knew, uh, for a while, I had, he was a big fan of uh, Drugstore Cowboy, and I had shot some commercials with him, and uh, when he uh, uh, got the money to do CQ, uh, you know, he asked me if I'd do it, and I, and I was thrilled. I love Roman. I mean, Roman is like one of the sweetest, nicest guys I've ever known, and he's also uh, kind of a jack of all trades, because he's been in the business his whole life. He can shoot, he can edit, he can do, he can do just about anything, you know. And uh, so he was very uh, aware of of camera, obviously. And uh, he, we had several different styles for that CQ. Uh, we shot mainly on 35 millimeter, but then there was the uh, 16 millimeter black and white of Jeremy Davies' uh, documentary. Um, and so. Roman does extensive research, and uh, he, you know, the, the French New Wave again, the uh, Italian cinema, uh, you know, uh, boy, I'm trying to think of the documentary that he, uh, that we kind of based our thing on. I'll, I'll think about it, and I'll send sure. it to you. Yeah, but, please. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, shoot, darn, I can't remember. But anyway, uh, so we, we have a lot of re visual references that we go through quite extensively. And uh, so we, by the time we start shooting, you know, we have pretty much down, like he encouraged me for the uh, dragonfly sequences to shoot, use, shoot it more 70 style, mm. harder light, you know, and, and light it more in the direction of how it would have been done on the day. So I was challenged to do that. And, you know, the black and white documentary to shoot more in a documentary style. And uh, if anything, if I were to do the movie again, I might even take it more in the direction that he was challenging me to take it. You know, I, I feel like occasionally I'd pull it back and maybe put a little diffusion in front of a light or, you know, things like that, that just clean it up a little bit just for my own aesthetic. And maybe right. for the movie, I would have been better off just letting it go more in the style of the seventies, you know, um, but you know, it's awesome just... though. <laughs> and so was that what you, you, you mentioned you have known, you had known Roman for, for many years had you had you worked on anything with him or had you just connected over the years and, and just you know, known and run in different circles that that overlapped we did commercials and uh you know this was during the May, during uh, uh uh the time after i'd met wes we uh did second unit on uh, roman does second unit for his dad back then and uh the rainmaker was a film that his dad was shooting in, in Memphis. Uh, and uh, so Roman asked if I would do second unit on The Rainmaker, which, um, you know, John Toll was the cinematographer and, you know, it was a big, huge movie. And, you know, I was, I idolized his dad. His dad was one of my heroes. Uh, and so of course I said yes. And it was a great opportunity for me because it was the first time, because I came up through, low budget indie type movies i'd never worked on a union movie before and um in fact this movie got me into the union and uh i remember roman telling me that uh that he said oh he's telling he's telling me that he was telling his dad that 
you know, well, Bob has to join the union in order to be doing this. And his dad's comment was, another one bites the dust. <laughs> so, you know, because his dad, is, he, he thinks big, but he, he liked the idea of a small unit. And, and um, so we were constantly going off to shoot things, Roman and I, and, and we had just a few people. And his dad loved coming in and seeing what we were doing because his dad had fantasized about working this way, you know, versus having a huge Hollywood production with hundreds of people standing around. And, uh, you know, he fantasized, oh, that's making films, you know, going back and study, you know, shooting with, you know, eight people or whatever we had, you know. And, and uh, so we would frequently, uh, like when we, we ended up going to stages uh, in Oakland, at the very end of shoot on stage. And, and so John Cole would be on one stage and Roman and I would be on the other stage. And then Francis would be in the Silverfish and he could kind of see who was ready. And then if Roman and I were ready, he'd come over and shoot a shot there or he'd go with John Toll on the other stage. And, you know, I learned so much from watching uh, John Toll. Uh, as, I, as I said, I, I'd never worked with another experienced DP, so I, I've never seen anything as big as this. So I learned so much about lighting and, and things with John, and he was very generous, uh, uh, giving me a lot of advice about things, and it was, it was an incredible experience for me. So that's how I got started with Roman. In the meantime, well, since then, Roman does all the second unit for, for Wes, and Wes, early on, we never had a second unit. But it started on Life Aquatic, and um, Roman comes over, and because uh, he and Wes have such a close relationship, he goes out and shoots second unit shots for us uh, all the time now, and has has some last few films. It's a good segue, Bob, into Life Aquatic. Life Aquatic is sort of is so stylized, and I feel like a good starting point for the way the Wes Anderson films evolved. Um, I remember the first time you and I met years ago when you were making Moonrise Kingdom and I was fresh out of college and you were really kind enough to carve out time and walk me through the process of how you guys were making that movie in, in Rhode Island. And uh, I was truly like a month out of school or maybe not even now that I think of it because it was that summer of, of 11, you know, 2011. And when I think about going back to my question, uh, the segue into Life Aquatic, were you starting then to use animatics? Were you starting then together, you and Wes, to prepare shot by shot, um, sequence by sequence? Uh, not really the animatics at that point. Uh, it was more, you know, very uh, uh, intricate storyboards. And I'll send you, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send you some of those so you have. Cool. Them. And cool. Uh, you know. Again, it was a very long prep period, and it was particularly, that movie was in some ways the most difficult we did, because first of all, you're on boats, yep. which are totally uh, uncontrolled at sea, really. And we had so many different locations in and around Italy. It was all shot in Italy. We had the giant stages at Cinecitta. We had, uh, uh, you know, we went to Naples, we went to the Amalfi Coast. So it was a lot of driving up and down the coast of Italy looking for locations and, and figuring things out. It was very complicated. And, uh, you know, we also couldn't control the weather, obviously. And, and when we started shooting, it was late summer and it was bright and sunny. And then by the time we finished, it was winter and it was gray and cold all the time. And mm. So there was a lot of uh, issues around that. And, um, you know, kind of a funny story, uh, uh, you know, the, the cutout of the boat where Bill Murray yeah. says, look, you, you know, you probably know the shot. And so somebody uh, did a mathematical uh, uh, rendering of how, how the boat should get into this space on the stage at Chinichita. And uh, so Mark Freeberg, who's a very close friend of mine, was a production designer and a great, great production designer. Uh, they, they built the boat 
And so I came over with our widest anamorphic lens, which was, I think, a 32. And uh, Mark and I stood with our backs against the wall, and we couldn't get the boat into the shot. This is before we were going to shoot, uh, you know, several days. And uh, we both looked at each other like, oh, fuck. <laughs> you know, what are we going to do? You know, what's the us <laughs> if we can't get the boat in the shot? And... Uh, so I immediately got on the phone to Panavision and I said, do you have anything wider than this lens? And they said, we have a 28, you know, somewhere. I said, send it to me immediately. In the meantime, and I had asked Mark to keep the boat off the back of the wall so I could light the psych behind the wall. And I said, just drag it to the wall, you know. So they physically had to drag this entire, this boat was huge, the cutout. And they dragged it on the stage back to the wall. And like a couple days later, the lens arrived and I called Mark from the set. I said, Mark, I got the lens. Let's go check it out. So literally we're standing in the doorway with the door open and we're as far back as we possibly can. And we just got the boat in the shot and we're like, Oh, you know, both of us were just like, Oh my God, thank you. You know? And, uh, cause we didn't want to have to tell Wes, Oh, by the way, we can't get the boat in the shot. Well, the other idea was to, knock holes in the walls of the stage. And this was a famous stage of Chinachita that Fellini had shot on. And we were very reluctant to like destroy their walls. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, that, that, and that was, again, uh, it was kind of a tricky shot. We, we were on a techno crane where we're, ex, ex, you know, move, and it has to move from place to place to place. And, um, you know, with certain pieces of dialogue. So, in a in a storyboard or an animatic, you know, the camera can move very quickly, like, you know, around, 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 around. But in real life, it doesn't move quite that quickly. So that was a particularly difficult shot for us to pull off. It's such film. an iconic shot. Yeah, I get asked such about it a shot. lot, but I can remember my heart was just beating like this, trying to pull that one off, you know, and, um, you know, so anyway, that was... I love it. I love it. Take me now to Grand Budapest which is just a visual masterpiece and a feast for, for the audience. That had, like, I know you mentioned that uh, post-production became a bigger part of the process with the West movies. Things being just in camera became less so the focus. But still, the camera work in that film is just absolutely spectacular. That film, curious on just the backstories, Bob, and um, any anecdotes on, on making it and the process having evolved so differently than you know, back in the earliest days, twenty-five years prior of you know making making Bottle Rocket. Yeah. Uh, well, it's uh, you know we, we West found this beautiful uh, little town, Gorlitz, Germany, which is on the eastern border, uh, right across the river from Poland, and um, basically he had scouted Eastern Europe. Uh, pretty extensively looking for hotels. And, you know, the thing that he realized was no hotel is going to let us come in and paint the walls and control it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so he was looking for another space. And someone said, oh, there's this town of Gurlitz. And he found, he said, okay, I'll go check it out. And uh, he found it. And uh, there was an old department store that's five floors and it was just sitting empty. And uh, he said, okay, this is, uh, th they said, you can lease it for a year and do whatever you want. So we knew we could control it. We could build what we wanted. We could paint the walls. And it had a beautiful skylight up top that kind of lit the whole place. And so uh, Wes decided, okay, this is perfect. I'm gonna make the top floor all the production offices, the wardrobe room, the top two floors were camera room, you know, production art department, everybody was in the one place. Yeah. And um, then the bottom floors were our set. And the first floor was, of course, where we had the lobby and, you know, all the other rooms we could make there. And uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, kind of ideal for us. I mean, I did have to, argue with him a little bit because his his concept had been to shoot in available light and it was lit by the skylight well the problem with that is we were in eastern germany in january where it's dark and it's light about 
maybe I think our exterior days were 8.30 to 2.30 or 3. Wow. Then it's dark, you know, I mean, and, uh, and um, it, it, when you're inside a building like that, you need to put lights up to come through and maintain that because basically it was a little bit of a struggle for me, but I allowed, he finally let me do it. And it allowed us to shoot. We could be there at noon. We could be there at midnight. It would always look the same, you know. And uh, so um, I think it was money well spent, and the effort we did to put it on it was well spent. Um, you know, it, it's uh, uh, most of the movie was shot right there, and and or within walking distance of our hotel, which is right near there. And we just found all the locations all around Gurlitz, which was this beautiful little town in the city in Germany that no one was there. It was winter. And uh, occasionally we would have to go, like the prison was uh, at another uh, uh, little town where we kind of did an overnight there for a few nights. Uh, again, a similar situation to the prison. There was a skylight that we just pounded HMIs through. and. Uh, you know, um, there was always a certain amount of negotiation I have to do with Wes for gear, you know, and, and he, he, he's a very much uh, less gear is better uh, of a mind. And, and so, you know, we always have a little bit of a negotiation as to what I can do and what I can't do. So, but I, I've learned to just prep him and tell him, you know, beforehand what's going to happen so he doesn't show up and, and uh, you know, yeah. is, is surprised. What do you mean there's lights coming out through here? You know, I mean, he's, he's not surprised. So I, I do a little prep. But we also shoot film and, um, and we shoot a, a slow stock, which means more light. And it's not like shooting with an Alexa where you can go in oftentimes with very little lighting and do something. It's, it's a different animal entirely. So, and Bob, um, that's, a, that's a perfect segue again to you obviously you mentioned the, the coppola film you sort of got your union card um yeah. had never worked on big studio projects with big you know infrastructures and unions involved now you do shoot you you shoot very big studio movies now um <clears throat> i'll let you sort of pick whichever studio movie um you know you, you, you'd like to reference I mean, it's just it's an awesome story certainly i have to imagine for you looking back at this really storied career uh, and now shooting these big studio pictures. And there's not that many cinematographers shooting these big studio pictures because there's just not that many of those studio pictures being made. And you're, you're one of a, a handful that are consistently shooting pictures with some of the biggest directors and some of the biggest stars in the world. Well, I guess the first one I did was uh, Get Him to the Greek with Nick Stoller. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to think how that came about. Uh, I think because Nick and Rodney Rothman, who was his writing partner at the time, um, they were fans of my work and they just kind of out of the blue said, hey, why don't we try this guy? And uh, I met Nick and he's a sweetheart, wonderful guy. And I thought the script was really funny. And uh, uh, so that was my first venture into uh, uh, big studio movies. And, and it was Judd Apatow was a producer. And so I was part of the Judd team. And um, I had kind of been, I'll tell you kind of a funny story. I, I had kind of agreed to do another movie, but not, I hadn't signed a deal, but just verbally had said, yeah, yeah. but. The producers were, you know, wanting to pay me very little money, and there was a little bit of arguments going on. And uh, so I was color timing, uh, get him to the Greek over at Company Three, and uh, Judd Apatow came by, the producer, to kind of look at the, see what we were doing, and he said, uh, "Hey, Bob, uh, can I talk to you for a minute?" I'm like, "Yeah, of course, Judd." <laughs> you know. And so we went out into the hallway and uh, uh, he said, I got a movie I want you to shoot. Uh, and I said, oh, uh, well, I'm supposed to be doing this other thing. And he said, yeah, I know, I know all about that. I know other people, blah, 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 but I want you to do this movie. And I said, okay, well, it's a little awkward, but what? And, and he said, it's called Bridesmaids. 
And uh, he, he said, I want you to meet Paul this weekend and, and just see if you guys hit it off. So I said, of course, Jen, you know, and, and I mean, Jen's a big power player. And um, so, so I met Paul for a lunch and Paul, of course, showed up wearing his three piece suit and looking very dapper and, you know, uh, uh, but I like Paul. He was very funny and I could tell very bright and, and uh, originally Bridesmaids was a little bit different movie when I signed on to it, uh, you know, Kristen and Annie had written it and uh, Kristen Wiig, and it was a little more of a personal, smaller story. And I think when Judd got involved, he added a lot of elements to it that were there uh, initially. And uh, so uh, little did I realize that this movie was going to be such a huge hit. And, uh, uh, like when I, I remember when I saw Get Him to the Greek, when I saw the uh, screening of it, the cast and crew screening, I said, this movie's going to be a huge hit. It is funny. It's, it's got everything, you know, and, and I, I thought this was going to be a blockbuster. And not that it did poorly, but it, it didn't do as well as, as I think people were expecting. And then when Bridesmaids, I was like, well, you know, we'll see how, what happens. And of course, it became this uh, huge hit, you know, and and, uh, and people, particularly women, really responded so positively to it. It was finally a movie about women and not, they weren't just the girlfriends, you know, and I, I, I you know, there was a certain amount of level of humor to it that was on the cruder side that you hadn't seen before. And, and it became kind of iconic in a way. And um, I remember a few years later, I was doing a commercial in um, Detroit and um, I, I showed up on the set one day and the production manager was this woman in Detroit and she came up to me and she said, you know, I, I am DB'd you yesterday. And I said, oh, really? And, you know, I was expecting Rushmore and Little Tenement. She goes, you shot bridesmaids! <laughs> and I used to joke with Paul. And I say, they're going to put that on my gravestone. He shot bridesmaids. <laughs> you know, we used to joke about that all the time. Um, I love but it. Anyway, it started my relationship with Paul. I did the Heat, and I did Spy, and I did Ghostbusters with Paul, and we had four movies. And um, I've shot commercials with him. Paul's a great guy. It's, it, you know, he couldn't be, a, you know, more opposite than Wes. I mean, whereas Wes is so specific about everything, Paul prefers to, uh, I mean, he's, you know, we have an idea, but we kind of bring the actors in and they kind of, it's a lot of improv. We shoot two cameras. We cross shoot all the time. It's so much is just kind of, uh, uh, spontaneous riffing and you know he wants to have both sides of that because you can't really uh, uh, recreate some of those moments you know and so it's a diff totally different style but you know Paul's a wonderful guy a lot of fun and the sets are always a lot of laughs and fun and you know he's got great actors that he brings in and uh, it's about as opposite of shooting with Wes as you can find really so, I love it yeah. yeah, I know we're we're almost up on time here, and there's one thing in particular that I okay. read during some research about you, which is you had said somewhere that every day that you go to set, still there's a bit of nervousness or a yes. bit of uh, anxiousness as you as you as you head to set. Given what you've done in your career and the iconic movies that you've shot for you know, 25 plus years now, walk us through that 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 nervousness of still feeling that. Uh, when you're when you're going on doing a set, well, I you know I get up and I get in the van, I head out in there, and you know it's always a little bit nerve wracking because there's always you're never sure what exactly the problem is going to arise. You know you'll get there and you know the grip will say oh the but you know this is wrong or the lighting guy will say the generator broke or, you know, I mean, there's always something that I have to deal with or it's pouring rain outside and they're like, okay, we must still want to shoot even though it's pouring rain, you know, and it's, it wasn't what our plan was, you know, and so until we get the first shot, and often with Wes, some of the shots are very difficult to achieve. You know, they're tricky, and I operate the camera with Wes, and so um, there's always a certain amount of uh, nervousness about that. You know, uh, to give an example, 
uh, we did a shot in Grand Budapest at the towards the end of the movie. There's a shootout on the top floor of the of the where Rafe comes out of the elevator, and yep. basically I have to pan, you know, basically do 360 degrees and hit certain actors at certain pieces of dialogue. So not only do I have to know the dialogue by heart and know where I have to be, but I have to anticipate a little bit and get there very quickly. And because it's so high up in the hotel, uh, the grips had built a scaffold for me to be on, and I'm way up in the air, and it, I'm up there by myself. Um, and uh, what I found was typically how I do those shots is I actually operate them uh, with a fluid head, and I move around the, the, the scaffolding. But I couldn't do that because it was so high, the scaffolding was kind of moving mm. when I was moving around it. So I realized I couldn't do that. Of course, now the actors are there. Wes wants to shoot, you know. And so there's a certain amount of nerve-wracking, you know, I'm nerve-wracked, you know. And, and so I used an old trip that, you know, many groups use. And I, I attached a laser pointer to the, the tripod head. And I put little X's on the ground. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I just could stand there and not move around and just kind of hit with the pan handle and just kind of hit those marks. And I capped the eyepiece. And that's how I did that shot, <laughs> you know. But th there's a certain amount of things where, you know, the pressure's on. And I can remember when we finally went said, okay, we got it. It's just the feeling of relief that I had, <laughs> um, you know, that I had been able to pull this thing off, you know, kind of by the seat of my pants. And so... There's all, frequently those types of situations that you encounter that kind of, it's like, you know, I used to play basketball as a kid in high school. And, you know, it's like pre-game pre jitters, you know, it's very similar, you know, and, and, and once you're there in the heat of battle, you kind of forget about everything else and you just concentrate on what you're doing. But before you get there, it's like being in a basketball game, you know, once you're on the floor and you're playing, you don't even think about it. But, you know, when you're sitting there on the bench waiting, you know, it's, it's your, your, your stomach is just going crazy. It's very similar. So, you know. Well, Bob, I, I, first off, I, uh, I want to thank you. you know, Ten years ago, you, you were incredibly gracious with your time then, and you gave a, a, a true lifelong Wes Anderson fan um, and someone that really I credit your work and Wes's work is one of the main reasons I wanted to go into this business and really a big part of the driving passion for. I remember your film, by the way. Your film yeah. at Lake Forest College, and uh, you, we came and we met down. I'm not going to say the name, but we met that little coffee house down there, and uh, I remember it very well. You know, but I remember you we went to Lake Forest College, and I grew up near there, and my cousins were from Lake Forest. So, you know. You've, you've always been such an awesome, grounded guy, and your work speaks a tremendous amount for itself and thank you for for carving out the time and chatting today and let's just keep in touch and i don't know if you have yeah. anything to, to close with but i feel like you've hit on everything and it's been a great conversation well this was a lot of fun thanks for having me and uh you know when this whole virus thing blows over maybe you might can meet for a lunch or a coffee or something sounds good bob thank you again all right. man all right cool all right well have a nice afternoon and uh stay safe you too bob talk soon man bye-bye Thank you all for listening to another episode of Greenlit, the Buffalo 8 podcast. For financing questions, feel free to contact us at Bondit Media Capital at info at bondit.us. For production, development, and distribution questions, feel free to contact us at Buffalo 8, info at buffalo8.com. We'd love to hear from you and hope you'll continue listening to the podcast episodes ahead.